In 1831, Victor Hugo wrote a book titled Notre Dame de Paris, known in the English-speaking world as The Hunchback of Notre Dame. It has been adapted for the screen many times. In 1923, it was adapted for the screen by Universal and starred Lon Chaney Sr., the man of a thousand faces himself. It was next adapted for the screen in 1939 by RKO Studios, the studio that brought King Kong into existence, and starred Charles Lafton, the rival of Laurence Olivier, as Quasimodo. In some ways, it imitated the 1923 film, featuring Claude Frollo as a saintly archdeacon with his brother Jehan taking the role of main antagonist. This was in due part to the Hayes Code preventing the portrayal of sinister clergymen. Allied Artists Pictures Corporation brought the next adaptation of the Victor Hugo novel in 1956 and it starred Anthony Quinn, son-in-law to Cecil B. DeMille. It proved to be the most faithful big screen adaptation of the novel so far, even if it did change Esmeralda's death from being hanged to being killed by a stray arrow. It was next adapted in 1977 by BBC and featured Warren Clark as Quasimodo in what has proven to be the most faithful adaptation, period. The book was next adapted for television in 1982 by Hallmark Hall of Fame. It featured Anthony Hopkins as Quasimodo, an actor known for playing Othello and would go on to play Titus Andronicus. The film features an element from the 1939 film where Esmeralda falls in love with the poet Pierre Gringoire. In 1986, Burbank Films Australia brought the first animated adaptation of the novel to television. It featured Tom Burlinson, a Canadian-born actor, in the role of Quasimodo. 1996 saw six animated adaptations of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. One big budget film, one television series, and a bunch of director video movies. One of which should not be spoken about. And then in 1997, there was a movie with Manny Patinkin. Oh, and I forgot the Dingle Pictures one. Oh, wait, I don't really want to be talking about the subject of this, but I'm going to anyway, because someone has to, so it might as well be me, the YouTuber nobody cares about. <sighs> I'm okay. I'm cool. I'm fine. It's not that bad of an ending. It's not like they just spared everyone, turned Phoebus and Florida hunchbacks. Turned Johnny into human for Gringoire to marry and had Frollo officiate the wedding between Gringoire and Jolly and Quasimodo and Esmeralda. I'm fine. I'm fine. By the way, I'm acting. Okay, on the level, it's not that bad. Okay, the two, the first two thirds of it, quite good. Then we reach the last third of it, and then it just... I don't know what happened. I guess I better start at the beginning. The company that produced it is Mondo TV. Their greatest claim to fame is, well, less, and to be honest, that wouldn't come out for another two years, and... They have made some good things, but this is really what everyone thinks of when they think of Mondo TV. Maybe. Okay, so in 1997, they made Supernatural Fantasy Heroes, a TV show, which is basically a crossover for literary, mythological, and historical figures. You're probably understanding where I'm going with this. 
Okay, long story short. Descendants of a bunch of figures brought together to fight some demon king. Okay, that's it. Let's just move on to the Hunchback of Notre Dame retelling. Because that's what we're here for. If you really want to watch it, then go to the playlist for Super Mario Phantom Heroes on Mondo World. It's a channel on YouTube. Go to episode 14. 14 and 15 are basically just an animated remake of the Anthony Quinn film. Then we get to episode 16, and that's where things get bizarre. So... Episode 16 opens not long after Esmeralda's hanging. Yeah, she was hanged, not shot by an arrow. It's not a perfect remake of the Anthony Quinn film. Or is she dead? The answer is no. She's just unconscious, so Gwengwar and Clopin's wife take Esmeralda's unconscious body to the Court of Miracles. Hmm. That's logical. Then some member of Clopin's inner circle tells the thieves and vagabonds to gather the judge that sentenced Esmeralda, Phoebus, Rollo, and Quasimodo because no, oh, because that's just Clopin's wishes. Why? Oh, you'll find out why. Next up. Esmeralda is watching the Court of Miracles, and she is healed by magic, apparently. Yeah, and this should have been a clue of what was to come. What were they thinking? While that happens, Gwengwar and Clopin talk about how the faked hanging went. Yes, it was actually faked. Turns out, Gwengwar and some of... Clopin's men tied up the actual hangman, and they faked the hanging. After a scene where the vagabonds cite Phoebus and Fleur de Lis, we get a scene of them bringing the judge to the Court of Miracles. While that is going on, a fortune teller tells how... I don't really know how to describe it. It's weird. Basically, people need to be brought to... Esmeralda starting with Crollo, who's apparently become the greatest sorcerer. I don't know, none of this makes any blasted sense. With the magical adventures of Quasimodo, I'm able to accept it because it's right there in the title. It doesn't come out of nowhere like this, but... What? What is this? What? Frollo became the greatest sorcerer without even realizing it. It doesn't even stop there. Apparently Frollo uh, somehow accidentally cast spells big and small that altered reality. What? I don't... How? Anyway, after that... Bizarre scene. We're treated to a scene of the Vagabonds bringing Phoebus and Fleur de Lis to the Court of Miracles. Excellent, so Phoebus is going to get some comeuppance other than dying like he did in the 1939 film. Then we get Clopin receiving the judge who sticks him in the corner because we have to wait for everyone. Oh joy, this is going to be long. After that, we have the Vagabonds finding Frollo's unconscious body. How is he unconscious when he was thrown by Quasimodo from the balcony of Notre Dame? I don't know. This is really stretching my willing suspension of disbelief. I'd be going farther than that and abusing it. They also find Quasimodo unconscious in the sign, but how he's even alive because he hurled himself from the bell tower and the pain that can be caused from hitting water from such a height is... What? How, how are either of them alive? So with everyone there, the fortune teller heals Frollo, uh, they tie up Phoebus and Fleur, and Quasimodo's just lying half-conscious in a corner. With everyone 
that's required to be there, well, there, Clovin then performs magic and Esmeralda regains consciousness. Very strange, isn't this? Well, moving on, Clopin sentences the judge to five years of service in the Court of Miracles. That's quite lenient compared to what he's going to do to Phoebus and Fleur de Lis, the latter of which isn't really a guilty party. We then get to Clopin's trial of Phoebus. You know, if this had been an accurate adaptation, Clopin would have already been dead by this point, but. Well, all fidelity has gone out the window. Phoebus states that he's up to his ears in debt, and thus that's why he has to marry Fleur de Lis and had Esmeralda condemned. Granted, uh, Fleur de Lis is his cousin, and thus the marriage is most likely arranged, but. Eh. Then Clopin turns them both into hunchbacks. Why? I don't know. Why Fleurs and Clopin, and unless when they could have just married her to a vagabond man is beyond me, but why does Phoebus look so blasted happy in this shot? And apparently Phoebus is named the new bell ringer of Notre Dame, so apparently the bell ringer has to be a deformed hunchback. What? And Fleur de Lis is made to go with him. What the hell? Phoebus is basically better off than Quasimodo was. After that, Lopin asks Gwen Gwar what he wants most to response that he wants to become a great writer, find his muse, and never be separated from Jolly. Oh dear, and this is where things can really get weird. And then Clopin turns Jolly into a human girl for Gwen Gwar to marry. Actually, this is equally as weird as turning Phoebus and Fleur de Lis into hunchbacks. I mean, granted, bestiality's frowned upon in the civilized world, so makes sense. And, and then Esmeralda kisses Quasimodo's unconscious form. Clopin does the magic, and Quasimodo becomes a regular looking dude. What the hell? You're ripping off Golden Films. Who does that? Oh, and the magic cured his deafness. That is not from Golden Films. Just him becoming a regular looking guy is from Golden Films. I can't make sense of this. Landing is a redeemed Frollo performing a double wedding. So Quasimodo marries Esmeralda. Ren Gwar marries a human jolly, and I am left wondering what drugs the writers were on. As super literal fantasy heroes dictated, due to one of the protagonists being a descendant of Quasimodo and Esmeralda, they had to survive, but they didn't really have to go with the whole everybody lives thing. They didn't really even have to include magic. It makes no sense. I mean, yes, the others are, the other protagonists are descendants of Hercules, Ulysses, people who were involved with Greek gods. And also, there's a descendant of the thief of Baghdad, but this is adapting something that had no magic, nothing fantastical. What is this? It makes no sense. Uh, my verdict for this whole thing? If you want to watch it, watch the first two. Uh, don't watch part three. Unless you want to. You only want to do that if you're a completionist.